Good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Tuesday of the 22nd week after Pentecost. Thanks for being with me tonight. Uh, the scriptures we're using are Psalm number 28. Uh, we're going to finish Jeremiah chapter 36 and we'll move into 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's start with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm is number 28. O Lord, I call to you, my rock, do not be deaf to my cry, lest if you do not hear me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my prayer when I cry out to you, when I lift up my hands to your holy of holies. Do not snatch me away with the wicked or with evildoers, who speak peaceably with their neighbors while strife is in their hearts. Repay them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their actions. According to the work of their hands, repay them and give them their just deserts. They have no understanding of the Lord's doing, nor of the work of his hands. Therefore, he will break them down and not build them up. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my prayer. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I have been helped. Therefore, my heart dances for joy, and in my song I will praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a safe refuge for his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them and carry them forever. Let us pray. 
strong shepherd of your people. When your son stretched out his hands on the cross, you heard him, and he did not become like those who go down into the pit. By his resurrection, strengthen your people to offer you thanks for the mighty works that you have done, and make our hearts dance for joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so our first reading comes from the 36th chapter of Jeremiah. And we'll begin where we left off yesterday at verse 27. Now, after King Jehoiakim had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. And concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, You have burned this scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land, and will cut off from it man and beast? Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, He shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants, for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the people of Judah all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, but they would not hear. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord that he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So there we go. Close enough. All right. So yesterday we read about King Jehoiakim. <laughs> He's just not going to hear it. When, uh, when they read the words of the scroll and the destruction that God had said was coming, every time he read a couple of columns from it, the king would cut it off and throw it into the fire that was in front of him. He was not, he was not listening. So we now find out that the king's foolish attempt to silence the word of God failed. And at Jeremiah's dictation, Baruch rewrites the scroll, including also the prophecy of disaster pronounced for their iniquity on Jehoiakim, his servants and Jerusalem itself. Right? So, God says it's going to happen. Just because you take the written warning and throw it in the fire doesn't change the warning. And did he really think that God wouldn't remember the word that he spoke to his prophet? So he gave the prophet those words again. And Jeremiah, through the hand of Baruch, had it rewritten on another scroll. And this time, all right, Jehoiakim, now that you have chosen to burn the word of the Lord... You and your, yeah, you will have none to sit on the throne of David, so his children will not ascend to the throne. His body will be cast out. It will not be protected from the elements. That's not good. David had been buried, and each of the kings had been buried with or near him. This one is going to be just laid out in the elements. So, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the people of Judah all the disaster that I pronounced against them, but they would not hear. Part of not hearing it is not, not being convicted by the word of God, not, um, not having that 
contrite heart that David talks about in Psalm 51, not, not feeling any sense of guilt, um, not being willing to or even wanting to confess your sins, and not certainly not repenting. They didn't even take the first step, which was to hear God's word. So he did. He wrote on it all the words that were burned, and many similar words were added to them. And I have a little note here. Um, completing the book of Jeremiah that by divine providence lies before us. Wow. All right. So <clears throat> now, so the second scroll is completed, and now we have... Zedekiah, the son of Josiah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered them and appointed this guy as king, although how much of a king is he? But he made him king in the land of Judah. And he reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. To me, this is um, fulfillment of this, right? He, Jehoiakim will have none to sit on the throne of David. So Zedekiah takes the throne. Um, so um, in in this chapter, and we're gonna we're gonna be in chapter thirty seven and thirty eight the rest of this week. Okay. So in these two chapters, Jeremiah is firm in proclaiming the inspired word during the last two years before the fall of Jerusalem. In three private interviews with Zedekiah, Jeremiah did not hesitate to announce the fearful fate awaiting the king, the city, and its inhabitants, nor did scourging or jailing and the threat of death by the princes cower him into deviating from the truth. This is why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. They beat him. Scourging him is a whip that has sharp metal on the end of the whips right and it just lays your flesh open it's horrible torture and jeremiah insisted on telling them the truth of god's word he did not back down jeremiah was called to his first discussion with the king when nebuchadnezzar lifted the siege of jerusalem to engage an army under the pharaoh he was asked to pray that the babylonians be forced to stay away permanently but Jeremiah announced their inevitable inevitable return to burn the city with fire. So that's what we're going to read more about tomorrow. But this is the introduction of King Zedekiah instead of Jehoiakim's son. So, but regardless, this new this Zedekiah or his servants or the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord that that Jeremiah brought as God's prophet. They still didn't listen. Babylon is about to just totally devastate them. So their loss. All right. So let's move to 1 Corinthians. And today we are in chapter 14. And we're going to read the first 12 verses of that book. Okay. St. Paul writes, Pursue love. And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes. How will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, 
how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So um, yesterday's reading was, of course, that very famous reading about what love is and what love is not. That love is patient and kind, does not envy, is not arrogant or rude, right? So he begins today's reading with pursue love. That's what you should do. Now, remember, this letter is written to address division in the church. And chapter 12 was about um, the different spiritual gifts. It's clear and that this church believed that certain people with some spiritual gifts thought them to be better than other people with other spiritual gifts, particularly, it seems, the speaking in tongues. And he's in what he's doing here is he's tearing them down not tearing them. He's, he's lowering them on the, on the hierarchy saying, you think you're better than all the rest and you're really not. And here's why, right? One who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Nobody understands it, right? If you've heard speaking in tongues, it's not um, English. It's not, it's, it's, it's intent. It's believed to be a divine language that earthly ears are not meant to understand unless you have the gift of interpretation, which is another spiritual gift. All right. Prophecy is established, however, as one of the chief gifts, right? Um, so, and he's going to use that one to compare, right? This is desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. So he's lifting this one up as the best of the gifts. Why? Well, and he, he does a contrast here, right? Somebody speaking in a tongue, nobody knows what he's saying. It's not doing any good to the people around him. But somebody who prophesies, everybody understands him because the prophecy is for their upbuilding, their encouragement, their consolation. One of those, whatever it is, that prophecy is for the good of the church, for the good of the Christian community. The one who speaks in a tongue just builds himself up. So he's the only one that it's that it does any good for. He may not even know what he's saying, but he knows he has a spiritual gift. He's the only one that's getting anything out of it. But the one who prophesies, the church gets something out of it. He that the one who is prophesying builds up the church. Now I do want you all to speak in tongues, he says. I do want you all to speak in tongues. Um Well, oh, pardon me, but even more, I want you to prophesy because it's an even better gift. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Speaking in tongues may build up the church if you have someone there to interpret it, right? Otherwise, the one who prophesies is greater. That's the greater gift, according to what Paul is saying here. Um, yeah, tongues became edifying, in other words, helpful, teaching, educational, edifying through translation or explanation. It's the only way they did any good. Um, if you look at Acts chapter two, where tongues are followed by quotation of scripture and preaching, Luther understood the practical concerns raised by ritual language because of the medieval custom of using Latin rather than the common language of the people. Imagine that. if we And that happened in the United States up until the 60s in the Catholic Church. Their whole worship service was in Latin. So people were coming to church and just reciting it, and they didn't know what they were saying. And the priests knew, and those who were trained knew, but the average person just, they were just going from memory. It was meaningless. It was, they were clanging gongs, right? Right. If I speak in tongues but have not love, I am a clanging gong. If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless you bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Unless I bring you that, right? 
I have to explain it to you. Otherwise, you don't get anything out of it. Lifeless instruments, if musical instruments that are that don't play themselves, if they don't give distinct notes, how will anyone know what's being played? Right? It's not going to be music. It's just going to be noise. If the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? Right? If you're going to play the battle or the bugle to get people ready for battle, there's a very sharp, loud, specific no noise you had to make or sound you had to make with that bugle. They didn't do that. They're not going to know that it's a sound to come to battle. And so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that's not intelligible, how will anyone know what's said? They're not. If you can't understand it, you will be speaking into the air. Your words will just be going into the air and dissipating. And they will have been lost forever because it was meaningless and no one understood it. There are doubtless many different languages in the world and none is without meaning. Those languages are spoken and understood by the people that live in those areas. But if I don't know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. We won't understand each other. There is no communication happening. It's, there's no exchange of ideas and mutual understanding. It's not going to work. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the spirit, Strive to excel in building up the church. Don't wish for spiritual gifts for the sake of the gift. Wish for the spiritual gifts for the sake of building up the church. That's what Paul is getting at. Make sure you want these things for the right reasons. That's why God gives us gifts and talents for the good of the church and the Christian community. Okay, that's all for our readings today. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, where he has remembered his promise of mercy the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy gathering and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for Bishop Dan and Dean Steve, for your servant, for Pastor Henry, Pastor Nelson, Vicar Rebecca, for all our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, 
wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. And also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our Vespers for this Tuesday, this Halloween night. Uh, thank you for being with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, I do wish you a happy Halloween this evening, uh, all Hallow's Eve, as it used to be called. And uh, I hope you all and your families are safe, and that tonight is fun for everyone. So uh, I think we'll be on track. There. We may have a delay tomorrow, but if we do, I'll announce that. So Appreciate your flexibility as always. So again, thanks for being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your evening. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.